During the Trump administration, President Duterte went on a brutal extrajudicial killing spree. He ordered the murder of thousands of people he claimed were suspected drug dealers without any trial, without any due process. Duterte was right in the middle of that campaign of bloodshed when President Trump praised Duterte for what Trump said was an unbelievable job on the drug problem. So, yeah. But Trump gave Duterte more than just praise. He also gave him highly sensitive information about U.S. nuclear submarines off the coast of the Korean Peninsula. According to a transcript of a call between Trump and Duterte in April of 2017, the two leaders were discussing the North Korean nuclear threat when Trump told the Filipino strongman about two active nuclear subs stationed near North Korea. We have two submarines, the best in the world. We have two nuclear submarines. Not that we want to use them at all. I've never seen anything like they are, but we, we don't have to use this. But Kim Jong-un could be crazy, so we will see what happens. According to BuzzFeed News, defense officials were livid about Trump's disclosure, saying, quite plainly, we never talk about subs. That was the first time we learned that Trump had spilled secrets about nuclear submarines, but it was hardly an isolated incident. That same year, Trump held a high-level meeting to discuss a North Korean missile launch, not in the Situation Room at the White House, but on the outdoor dining terrace at Mar-a-Lago. Trump was dining with the Japanese prime minister when he got the news of the missile launch, and the club was filled with random people who do not have security clearances. And instead of going somewhere private to discuss the missile launch, Trump decided to take the classified briefing with dessert. A Mar-a-Lago club member even posted photos of this classified briefing to Facebook with the caption, wow, center of the action. Yep. That same year, Trump hosted the Russian ambassador and the foreign minister at the White House, which would have been controversial enough on its own had we not later learned that President Trump also divulged highly classified information to those two Russian officials as well. Also that year, Trump went on Fox News and appeared to disclose classified information about a previously un unknown CIA data breach. With the CIA, I just want people to know, the CIA was hacked and a lot of things taken. That was during the Obama years. That was not during us. That was during the Obama situation. All of that, all of that took place during Trump's very first year in office. That, that stuff alone was year one. It did not end there. There was a time Trump tweeted a classified drone photo of an Iranian space facility. There was a time he sat down for an interview with journalist Bob Woodward and ended up revealing the existence of a secret U.S. nuclear program. And there was the now infamous moment when Trump allegedly waved around classified Iran war plans in front of Mark Meadows' biographer while demanding that someone bring him a Coke. And now, today, The New York Times and ABC News are reporting on yet another instance of Trump giving away America's secrets. According to these new reports, after he left office, Trump gave away yet more classified information about America's nuclear subs, this time to an Australian billionaire. The billionaire is a man named Anthony Pratt, who runs one of the world's largest cardboard companies and is a club member at Mar-a-Lago. According to this new reporting, Trump gave Pratt highly sensitive information that could endanger the U.S. nuclear fleet, including the supposed exact number of nuclear warheads U.S. submarines routinely carry and exactly how close they supposedly can get to a Russian submarine without being detected. According to sources who spoke with ABC News, that Australian billionaire then described Trump's remarks to at least 45 others, including six journalists, 11 of his company's employees, 10 Australian officials, and three former Australian prime ministers. So not, not a discreet person, this cardboard mogul. Now, NBC News has not independently verified these reports, but it appears the reason we're learning all of this now is because special counsel Jack Smith's team has reportedly interviewed that Australian billionaire, that cardboard mogul, and they have put him on a list of 80 witnesses who could testify in the Mar-a-Lago classified documents trial in May. Which raises a whole bunch of questions about the evidence Jack Smith has amassed in this case that we don't even know about yet.
Joining me now is former U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, Barb McQuaid, who also co-hosts the Sisters in Law podcast, and Devlin Barrett, justice reporter for The Washington Post and co-author of the Trump Trials newsletter. Devin, Devlin, I'm reminded of um, a piece you wrote in November of last year. The headline has always stuck with me. I think we can pull it up now. Investigator, investigators see ego, not money, as Trump's motive on classified papers. I thought of that headline when we learned this news about Trump bragging about nuclear submarines and divulging secret information to ran random cardboard moguls. How do you see this behavior dovetailing with your thesis? So I think, to your point, there are examples of this. It's not just one instance. These aren't one-offs. This is a thing he tends to do, which is sort of talk about areas and get into conversations with people that the security professionals, the intelligence officials don't want him to get into. I, I will say there's one weird silver lining in some of this. And to go back to the point you made about him waving around the Iranian document, as far as we can tell, he often gets de significant details wrong here. So one of the in conversation, I mean, so one of the strange elements of this whole situation is that. This incident could obviously be used as evidence of intent and potential harm by Jack Smith in a trial, but it also may not necessarily be chargeable if the information he's relaying to people isn't correct. That's so ironic that you can actually count on the information somehow being wrong, and therefore it's not as much of a security breach. I do have to ask you, though, I mean, as a reporter... The instances of Trump giving away secrets, I mean, these are just the ones we know of. There were so many in the first year in office. This behavior continues in his post-presidency. It seems like, Devlin, it is impossible for us to truly have a handle on how much he is talking out of turn. Right. I mean, and you see, you know, so much of his public persona is just sort of, for lack of a better term, riffing. And for someone who gets the presidential daily brief, you know, for years and years, you know, riffing can be quite dangerous or problematic. Um, but that's what he does conversationally. You can see many examples of this. And so obviously there is a significant concern here. And, and to your point, there are 80 people listed as potential witnesses in this case. You know, you have to think about what are the odds that this particular Australian is the only person who is going to tell a story like this about private conversations with the former president. Yeah, that's exactly right, Barb. I mean, the fact is we're learning about this person because of Jack Smith. And he has a list, 80 people long. We know about some of uh, we have sort of breadcrumbs. But what is the fact that this anecdote has not been relayed before? It has been kept under wraps. It wasn't in the indictment. What does that tell you about the strength of Jack Smith's case, at least as we can ascertain that from the outside? Yeah, I think this is just one example of many pieces of evidence that we're going to hear about at the trial that are not currently known. Uh, this, this story that we've heard about from this Australian billionaire sounds to me like the kind of thing that would be offered under a rule of evidence n number 404B. And that says that the prosecutor may bring in evidence, even though it does not relate to the charges in the indictment, if it can prove things like intent or modus operandi or uh, acts, a mistake of or, uh, absence of a mistake. And so for that purpose, it could be that they want to hear this story from this Australian billionaire and maybe others about the way Donald Trump would be very reckless in handling classified information, because that would tend to prove that he was very reckless in handling the documents with which he is charged. Can I ask, though, one of the things Jack Smith declined to do was pursue a dissemination charge, Barb. And the fact that he is, whether, you know, with malign intent or not, the fact that he is, in, f in fact, disseminating this information to random, you know, cardboard moguls, why not pursue a dissemination charge if you're Jack Smith and the DOJ? Yeah. So, you know, prosecutors have to think about, number one, can I file this charge and prevail? And number two, should I file this charge? And so it is absolutely a crime to verbally disclose classified information. And we don't know all the reasons, but I can tell you some, some things that could be at play here. Number one, uh, when there is an oral communication, it is much more difficult to prove because you have to prove that what the Australian billionaire heard is accurate 
that he is reporting it accurately, and that it was, in fact, classified. And so it may be that Donald Trump was making it up. Maybe he was puffing. Maybe he got the facts wrong, as we heard here. Um, it, it, the other thing about it is, if they need to prove that up, they might need to prove up that those facts are true. And if they are classified pieces of information, it may be that the government is more concerned about safeguarding that information than it is about winning any particular count. There were times when I was working as a national security prosecutor, when I had cases or counts I wanted to bring, but the intelligence community put the kibosh on it and said, no, it just isn't worth it because we can't reveal this classified information to the public. So you're just going to have to let this one slide. House Republicans are meeting next week to decide whether to put Trump's guy in charge, which is why, as Michelle Goldberg points out in her latest op-ed in The New York Times, it is now up to moderate Republicans to save the House, if only they can muster up some bravery to do so. Michelle Goldberg joins me now. Michelle, thanks for being here. And the question oh, is, if not now, when, moderates? If not now, when? I mean, what is this the moment? Do you, are you optimistic? I mean, no, I'm not optimistic. And the reason I wrote the column was not because I actually think that this is likely to happen, but because, A, it's what should happen. And it's actually, more, I think, a more reasonable ask than what we heard from both Republicans and a lot of pundits in the last few days, which is, why didn't Democrats save Kevin McCarthy? There's been a lot of hand-wringing that kind of Democrats didn't step up and save this speakership in exchange for a very explicit guarantee of nothing whatsoever. You know, re Republicans, moderate Republicans, which is a relative term, wouldn't even have to vote for Jeffries, right? I think that if you had moderate Republicans come up with some sort of, you know, relatively moderate candidate, they could make a deal with Democrats and they would sort of be in the catbird seat, right? All they need to do, they, we're not, you know, I, they, they don't have to do, they don't have to vote for someone from another party. They don't have to vote for someone who disagrees with them on all the major issues. In fact, what they could do is find someone who basically is one of them and elevate them. But again, I don't hold out that much hope of them having the courage to exert the same sort of political power that kind of Gates and his faction have tried to exert or it, have exerted. Do you think it's a purely a matter of the terror that would be inflicted upon them by the far right MAGA base of the House Republican conference? Because politically speaking, they're on pretty solid ground, right? I mean, if you're a moderate Republican looking for a more consensus candidate, you're going to have Democratic support in the House. There are a lot of moderate in the House. And like when you go back to your Joe Biden dominated swing district, it probably works out well for you. So is it just yes. the threat of the, the tweets and the Fox News hits? I don't know what it is besides just kind of pure cowardice and kind of a milquetoast orientation to politics. But you're absolutely right that these, you know, you have a bunch of Republicans, not a bunch, but a fair number of Republicans, certainly enough to swing the House, that come from districts that voted for Joe Biden, you know, sometimes by double digits. And so they are not going to presumably want to be going into 2024 with a House led by this you know, kind of pit bull for Trump figure, Jim Jordan. But I mean, yeah, that's what's so I think, but this has been something that's been confounding throughout the Trump years is the inability of people to stand up to them, even when it's in their own evident political interest. Today, a New York appeals court rejected Donald Trump's latest attempt to delay his civil fraud trial, allowing it to continue full steam ahead next week. And now that we have wrapped week one of this trial, we have some riveting new details, courtesy of Trump Organization Comptroller Jeff McConney, who took the stand and admitted that the valuations of Trump's properties were fraudulent, not by accident, but by design. Now, we have known for a while now that Trump was allegedly inflating the value of his apartments and his golf courses and so forth. Attorney General Letitia James presented that evidence to the judge in this trial, who has already found the Trump Organization guilty of fraud. But today we were given a detailed look at the extent to which the Trump's business to which Trump's business hyped the value of his properties. And it is staggering deceit. Take Mar-a-Lago. Last week, Judge Angoran ruled that the Trump that Trump had inflated the value of his beach club by a whopping twenty three hundred percent. 
According to Trump's financial documents, Mar-a-Lago was worth between $426 million and $612 million, all based on the premises on the premise that it could be sold as a private residence. Now, today we learned that that was a complete farce. And that is because the deed for Mar-a-Lago clearly states it can only be used as a social club. And if Trump can't sell Mar-a-Lago as a private residence, then it would likely be worth a whole lot less. To the tune of 18 to 27.6 million, according to Palm Beach County's appraisal. And then there is Trump's iconic Rococo apartment in Trump Tower. Yesterday, prosecutors asked McConney about the value of that very shiny penthouse, which at one point was, according to Trump, worth $180 million. And yet, a similar Manhattan apartment with extras, including a waterfront view, and which was allegedly owned by a foreign royal, that similar apartment was more than $100 million cheaper than what tr Trump valued his at. Now, Mr. McConney, the Trump Organization controller, claimed his $180 million estimate was based on square footage and that Trump's blindingly gold apartment was so expensive because it was 30,000 square feet. But that estimate, according to the judge in this case, is also an obvious lie. Trump's triplex is really around 10,000 square feet, which is, by the way, thousands of feet smaller than the similar apartment worth $100 million less. Joining me now is Christy Greenberg, former federal prosecutor and former deputy chief for the criminal division of the Southern District of New York. Christy, thanks for joining me here. I mean, there is like exaggeration and then there's just bold face lying. Were you surprised by the, the audacity of these inflations? Well, this was laid out, a lot of this was laid out in the judge's order last week. And it's interesting because there the judge said, look, I, this is a documents case on that one count on just the perpetual fraud. I, it's a documents case. This is plainly false. Just given the magnitude of, of these numbers and how different they are, this is egregious. And you used these documents in business, so therefore... You know, you're, you're liable for that other count. But now we're getting into at the trial other counts, insurance fraud, falsified business records, falsified financial statements. And there you have to show intent to defraud yeah. and that these are materially false statements that somebody, whether it's a lender, insurer, would have relied on them to give them favorable terms. And, you know, they're this defense that, that they are peddling, which is, you know, well, valuation, it's an, more of an art than a science. It's right. like, well, but this is math. Like, these numbers don't add up. They're, right. they're nowhere close to any of the other appraisals that are comparable. Like, it can't be the case. And, and it seems like they, they're going to have an expert say that, that there's no such thing as an objective valuation because, and therefore, you can never have an intent to defraud with the valuation, which is just, it's ludicrous. Yeah, well, especially when you're saying, Oh, this this Mar-a-Lago is worth so much money because it can be sold as a private residence. And the deed says that it can never be sold as a private residence. Right. Right. And then you have that's where you have the judge saying we're in fantasy world here. We're not yeah. in real world where deeds don't matter, where, you know, the, the, the square footage doesn't, you know, it can be inflated by, you know, 10,000, 20,000 square feet where, where objective you know, numbers aren't aren't uh, being calculated properly. Like it's just, it, it's it defies logic. I do wonder. There's um, a, a brand premium that they attach to the value of some of these properties, yeah. saying because it has the word Trump on it, it's worth thirty to fifty percent more. Now that seems more fungible, right? Like depending on what year of Trumpism we're talking about, the maybe it's worth more before the presidential election than it is after the fact. Is that something where there's any merit to the argument that the name matters, the na and and the inability to peg a specific value is not inherently fraudulent, or pegging a specific value to it is not inherently fraudulent? Well, I think the issue there is when you have a singular property and he's playing both sides of it. So when he's talking to the IRS, that property right. all of a sudden has a low value so that his liability goes down on taxes. But then that same property, when he wants to get a favorable turn on a loan, is a high value. So you can't have it both ways.